How's everybody feeling this morning? Isn't it good to be in the Lord's presence? I just love the moment that we had earlier, just sitting before the Lord. There's something about a people who are fully and completely surrendered to God, where, man, the Lord's presence cannot resist it. As we kneel, as we bow, we surrender everything that we have to him, and it's just a really beautiful thing when we do that. I believe God is really moving as we uh, really learn to steward those moments and we personally come with an expectation to meet with Jesus. How many come with an expectation every Sunday to meet with him? It's a really beautiful, wonderful thing, yeah. If you're new this morning, we haven't met, my name is Adam, and I just want to welcome you here this morning if you're visiting. It's so good to have you. I want to tell you kind of where we're at in the series right now. We're in week two of our series we were calling Second Priority. It's a series on the family. And let me tell you about last week. Last week uh, was our first uh, message in the series, and we said this, that we want to MGFP. Anybody remember that? It's a terrible acronym, but it works to help remember. MGFP, we want to make God first priority. Right, MGFP, that we would make God first priority. And here's the thing, we looked at Matthew chapter six, where it says, seek first the kingdom of God and what? His righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So as we seek God first, what happens? Everything else takes care of itself. Do you see that? Everything else takes care of itself. Now, here's the thing about it though. We don't wanna be Sunday morning Christians. We don't want to be just Wednesday night Christians when we come to church. We want to do everything, all things, that it would be worship to God, that we would approach our family, we would approach ministry, we would approach our work, we would approach everything as making God first priority, that everything would be worship unto the Lord. Now, this week, we'll be looking at our family relationships. Not only is making God a secret to being successful in our family relationships, But this morning, we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Philippians chapter 2. I've got to be honest with you this morning that this is a bit of a heavy and difficult message. This is one where I was was writing, I was like, man, this is stepping on my toes. I did not like it personally. This is one of those things where like, Lord, I want to be this. And it's a pursuit worth going after. Let's read this together. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. If you're there now and you got your Bibles turned, say, let's go. Let's go. Come on, say, let's go. let's go. All right, here we go. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy... So Paul here is being a little bit sarcastic because of course there is in God. Verse two, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I've entitled my message this morning, Navigating Your Second Priority. If you like my notes, you can text notes to the numbers on the screen and follow along this morning. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. Your word that is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. God, just as we surrendered in worship this morning by kneeling before our king, God, we recognize this morning that, Lord, we're servants of the most high God. And as servants, Lord, we just want to say to you, would you speak to us, God? Lord, I know that, God, you have divine appointments in this room. You have divine appointments, God. We are here for a purpose today. God, I pray that in our relationship with our families, God, no matter where we might find ourselves, Lord, whether we're single, married, maybe we've been divorced, 
maybe we're widow, whether we're young or old, God, that, Lord, we would learn to steward these family relationships really, really well. That, God, it would honor you. So, Lord, we say to you, just as Moses said, Lord, teach us your ways, for we want to know you, God. We want to know you. Would you teach us your ways? We want to know you. We want to find favor in you. We love you so much, God. We bless you. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Let me ask you a question this morning. How many of you feel absolutely lost when it comes to certain relationships within your family? You're not sure what to do. Maybe it's a crazy aunt or maybe crazy uncle, I don't know. Maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your kids, maybe it's with your parents, I don't know. It just feels like you're absolutely lost of what to do to mend this relationship. Let me give you some stats this morning. Sadly, 50% of marriages end in divorce. 53% of parents feel like they don't know what to do with their kids. 53%, if you're feeling that way, you're not alone. 1,300 blended families are created every single day. Here's the thing, there is a key to navigating these relationships. And Paul gives us this. He says this, he says that we would esteem others higher than ourselves. right? We care about them more than we care about our own self, look out for their interest and not our own that what we would do nothing out of selfish ambition. Now this is a hard thing to do, a hard thing for anyone to walk in and the key to the first four verses here in Philippians is found in verse five. What does it say in verse five? He writes, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. That we would take on what? The mind of Christ. That we would have his mind, you see, Jesus had a certain attitude, he had a certain way of walking when he walked this planet. Jesus thought a certain way. And now culture is telling us today, would you, would you do this? Would you look out for yourself? Look out for your own self because nobody's going to look out for you. You've got to look out for your own self, your own interest. But it goes against everything the Bible teaches us. To be able to esteem others higher than ourselves. To lay aside selfish ambition. To be able to do this, we have to think like Christ. We have to have the same thought process of Christ. So this is what I want to do this morning. I want to give you three attitudes when navigating our second priority. Three attitudes we must have from this passage when navigating our second priority. What is our second priority? It's our family. Our first priority is what? It's God. Our second priority is our family. That in everything that we do, we would put God's first, but as we're navigating our family relationships, I want to give you three things this morning. The first thing I want to give you is this. To successfully navigate your second priority, forget about your reputation. To successfully navigate your second priority, to navigate your family relationships, forget about your reputation. Philippians 2 says this, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Now there's a good way of thinking about reputation. The good way to think about reputation is you wanna be known as a person of integrity. That you be known as a person who keeps their word. Let me give you the definition of reputation so we can kind of apply it to the scripture here though. It says this, the definition, the appearance or the way you appear to other people. The appearance or the way you appear to other people. And so what he is saying here in this passage is quit worrying about how you appear to other people or your appearance. Here's the thing, in society today, we are so appearance conscious. We're so worried about what other people think about us. I mean, I think social media has started this. This thought process where we were more worried about what other people think than any other time in human history. And some of you are like, yeah, I see that, Adam. I know that. Absolutely, we are more appearance conscious than ever before. It's where we're at as society today. 
Is what happens though here is that when we are so appearance conscious is that we'll begin to compromise our Christian values. This passage is saying, hey, don't worry so much about yourself and what other people think and compromise the word of God. Compromise Christian values. So to understand verse seven though, we gotta go look back and look at verse six. So look at verse six now. It says this, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. So this little phrase here, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. It's kind of a tough phrase to understand. You're like thinking, okay, Adam, what in the world does that mean? That Jesus did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Here's the, what the Greek word means for robbery. It means this, to see something does not belong to you. To see something, to take something that does not belong to you. That's what robbery is. When you take something that does not belong to you. So it's saying this. In no way did Jesus take something that did not belong to him when it comes to the equality with God. In other words, Jesus is equal with God. He was equal with God. Jesus always will be equal with God. And so you could look at it like this. So Jesus laid down his right to be equal with God. He was fully man, yet fully God. He came and he laid down his right as God. So you could put it this way. Jesus laid down his right to be right. Jesus laid down his right to be right. And here's the thing with our marriage relationships, with our family relationships, if you want to see them succeed, at times in your life, you're going to have to lay down your right to be right. You're going to have to lay down your right to be right because you'd rather be right with someone than to be the one who is right. Would you rather be one or have won the argument? Some of you in this room, you're like, man, I want to win the argument. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove my point. I'm guilty of this all the time, y'all. I struggle with this where I want to win the argument against my wife and I want to prove myself that I'm the one who's right. But sometimes there comes a point in our relationships we've got to lay down our right to be right so that we can be right with that person. Right? So we've got to lay down our desire to win the argument so that we can be one. That's what Jesus did. He laid down his right to be right. He laid it down. He laid it down so that we could have life in him. And this is, this is a Christian principle. This is not just a marriage principle. This is a Christian principle that in all of our relationships, see, see, this, is what, this is what Paul's doing right here. He's begging the church in Philippi. He's begging them, would you walk in unity? Would you walk in as one, would you walk hand in hand? He's begging them, would you honor one another? Would you love one another? See, there's times as, as a married couple sometimes when I've talked with someone and I've thought to myself, okay, you're not only being a bad spouse, but you're being bad Christians. Like, would we walk in unity with everyone? And would we lay down our right to be right so that we can be right with others? The second thing I want to give you this morning to successfully navigate your second priority is to become a servant. Become a servant. This is a really encouraging message, isn't it? Lay down your reputation. Become a servant. Verse, five, verse 7 says this, excuse me. But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. He took the form of a bondservant. The word bondservant here literally means slave with no rights. Jesus laid down his form as God and he picked up the form as a servant. What did Jesus do? He came to serve and not to be served and to give his life as a ransom for many. And this is how we are to be successful in our relationships. Do you realize how many relationships would succeed if we just learned to do this? If we had two people in the relationship that would be serving one another? How many marriage relationships would really heal 
if we served our spouse, if we served them well, if we served others. Here's the thing, don't we like to talk about being kings and priests? God has made us kings and priests, and I love the fact that God has placed us and made us kings and priests when we follow him. He has made us kings and priests, but we don't like to talk about being servants, bond servants of God and being slaves to Christ, do we? I mean, think about it. Paul, when he started off his epistles, he never started off with, I, King Paul, <laughs> did he? What does he say? I, Paul, bondservant, slave to Christ. Let me ask you this. Are you a servant? If you're a Christian, yes, you are a servant. If you've given your life to Jesus, every single person in this room who's given their life to Jesus is a servant, a servant of God. That's who you're serving. So you might be thinking, I'm definitely not a slave to my spouse. No, who are you slave to? You're a slave to Christ, right? And so as a slave to Christ, as a servant to Christ, what does Christ ask you to do when it comes to relationships with others? So my next question is this, are you a good servant to others? Because when we don't follow what the Lord is asking us to follow and what he's asking us to do, it's rebellion. We're rebelling against God. 1 Samuel chapter 15, it says rebellion is a form of witchcraft. If you're not treating your family member, your spouse, your loved one, the way Christ has called you to treat them, to serve them, you're inviting witchcraft into your marriage relationship. And you wonder why, you wonder why it is so hard and so difficult. This is a hard message, y'all. <laughs> This is hard. Like, are we inviting witchcraft into our marriage relationships and not even realizing what we are doing because we are walking in rebellion and we're not walking with the way God called us to walk and the way that God called us to treat our spouse? Are we inviting re re rebellion? Are we inviting witchcraft into our relationship? We're not even realizing. Christ, what did he do? He took the form of a servant. What form are you taking on are you taking the form of a servant or are you looking far more like a dictator? Are you taking the form of a servant? This is preaching to myself right now. <laughs> or do I look far more like a dictator? I struggle in this area. It can be hard. It can be difficult. Sometimes I look far more like a dictator to my wife than I do a servant. When we come to a place where we say, okay, I want to outserve my spouse, it's a really beautiful thing where it just kind of brings things back together. A relationship where you're striving to outserve one another is a relationship that's going to succeed 100% of the time. If you have the challenge and you thought process, I challenge you this week, do this. Challenge you this week. How can you outserve your spouse without thinking to myself, well, they're not serving me, so I'm not going to serve them. You know what I'm saying? How can you outserve your spouse without expecting anything in return? My wife, she's, uh, she's very good at this. She's better than I am for sure. I remember back, uh, this one instance really sticks out to me. Uh, my kids were about two, three years old. They're, they're uh, 12 and 10 now, so it's nearly 10 years ago. And I had a really difficult day at church, and it was just some things went on, and it was hard. It was a struggle that day, and I was just kind of in a, in a bad spot. And I come home from work. It was late at night, probably 7.30, 8 o'clock. The house was spotless. The kids were already in bed. She had my favorite meal, which was chicken tetrazzini, which is this, this uh, chicken dish with 
white wine and butter sauce with capers and pasta on the table, ready for me. And she was there just to serve me because of my difficult day. And remember, like, she has a two-year-old and a three-year-old that she's taking care of all day long by herself. So how many know that when you have kids that young and you have the house spotless and you have dinner on the table and you're, you have, she had my favorite dress on too, which did, you know, that, was, that was pretty good as well. <laughs> when that's happening and going on, I'm like, man, thank you, Jesus. She decided to serve me despite her own tiredness of taking care of kids all day long. If that's not the epitome of servanthood, I don't know what is. To serve your spouse. To do those things when you know they've had a difficult day. How are you going to outserve them? I challenge you this week. Outserve your spouse. How can you do that? Don't, 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 don't look at, okay, they're not serving me well. They're not, no, how are you going to outserve your spouse? That's the challenge this week. How are you going to serve them? So point number three this morning I want to give you. To successfully navigate your second priority, you got to die to self. To successfully navigate your second priority, you got to die to self. To successfully navigate your family relationship, die to self. Verse 8 says this, In being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself. Himself. Another way to say that he humbled himself is that he took the low road. You know, there's only two times that we need to be people who take the low road. The first time that we take the low, low road is when we're wrong. And that's pretty easy to do, okay? We realize that we're wrong. We're going to take the low road. We're going to apologize. Cool. No big deal. I can take the low road when I realize I'm wrong. Some of you right now are thinking, though, Adam, I'm never wrong. I've got number two for you. When you take the low road, when you're wrong, but also when you're right. When you're wrong, also when you're right. Those are the only two instances when you take the low road. Good news. When you're wrong, when you're right. You might be thinking, Adam, how can I take the low road even when I'm right? I mean, that person is wrong. I should be expected to take the low road? I don't think so. But what did Jesus do? He always took the low road. Was Jesus ever wrong? No. Jesus took the low road and he was always right. Jesus took the low road and he was always right. Next part of verse 8. And became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Every day that Jesus lived, he took a step closer to the cross. He laid down his life every single day. He laid down his life for people. And he's the most successful person that ever lived. And I'm telling you to forget about your reputation Become a servant, take the low road, and die to yourself. And some of you might be sitting, Adam, I'm extremely successful and I've ever done those things. Listen, what is the measure in the bar for success? Is it money? Or is it being a good husband? Is it being a good father? Is it being a good wife, a good spouse? Is it being a good parent? What is the measure and the bar for success? Because it's not money. You know, money's become such a, a God in our life. The spirit of man, man is running rampant in society today. It is, we're, we're really a slave to money at times. Here's the thing about dying to yourself. You know, the way, one of the ways, the best ways to die to yourself is to trust God in your finances. I know many people have opinions about about tithing, but here's the thing about it. This is what I know. is the one area that Jesus says to test me in. Is the one area God says to test me in. Here's the thing. 
what God has given you? It's his. He gave it to you to steward. You want to learn to die to yourself? Begin to walk in obedience in this area in your life. You see, listen to me. God doesn't need your money. The church does not need your money. It doesn't. We're, we're a church that is not, we don't believe in the prosperity gospel. We're not a prosperity gospel type church. It's not like, okay, you're going to be, give, if you give, if you tithe, you're going to be given uh, just over the top um, incredible riches and you're going to have a mansion on the water. No, 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 no. That's not the case. We're also not a church that believes that you're going to be, you need to be poor. But what we do believe is that God's a God of provision. And he's going to provide for your every need. If you will trust him in this area, he will be your provision. Do you see that? As we give back to him is the easiest way to die to yourself. Now let me ask you this question. Is it possible, and we're talking about marriage now, is it possible that God did not create marriage to make you happy? Is it possible that God did not create marriage to make you happy? Some of you are thinking right now, well, it's working. <laughs> it's certainly working. Let me take it a step further. Is it possible that God actually created marriage to kill you so that you would die to yourself? Don't say out loud what you're thinking. Another question, is it possible that he actually did create marriage to make you happy but the only way you would ever be happy is when you die to yourself is it possible that he did create marriage to make you happy but you're only going to be happy you're only going to be full of joy if you literally begin to die to yourself you know I when I think about this I kind of wonder like Lord, when you created us, were you up there, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they're having a conversation, and you're thinking and saying, okay, how can we get them to die to themselves? Because it's the only way that they're going to be full of joy. And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are discussing, and they're like, okay, let's make them live with the opposite sex. Because how many know they're the opposite sex? Because they are opposite. And they go a step further, well, let's give them kids as well so they can die to themselves because you can't be up at 3 a.m. feeding your baby and not die to yourself. You know what I'm saying? Is it possible that the only way that we're going to be full of joy in our marriage relationships is that when we understand that we need to die to ourselves? You might be in a bad marriage right now. And you may be saying, Adam, like, are you saying that if I consider myself no reputation, I don't care about the way I look, and I become a servant, and I die to myself, that my bad marriage and this marriage relationship is going to 100% sure going to work out? I'm not saying that. It takes two people. It takes two people to serve one another. But what I am saying with this is this, that if you are doing these three things and you are serving and dying to yourself, and even though you might lose your marriage, and what we do is we pray through, you know, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. I believe God's gonna restore your marriage. But if it doesn't end that way, this is what I believe will happen, is that you will receive healing from the damage of that relationship not only that, but your kids will be protected. But what I believe is that God's desire is not for any relationship to end in divorce. He wants to restore every single marriage and bring every single person back together as you serve and as you love one another really well and selfishly, selflessly give to your spouse. Let me end with this. Verse 9, therefore God is also, I'm sorry, therefore God also is, has highly exalted him, lifted him up, 
and given him a name which is above every name. Listen, if you'll die to yourself, God will lift you up. You see, God will lift your life up. God will lift up your joy. God will lift up your peace. God will lift up your victory. God will lift you up when you've even put yourself down. Because that's the principle is that when you make yourself low, you take the low road and you die to yourself, God will lift you up. It doesn't matter if you're you're married, single, widow, divorced, young person, old person, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're at. The secret to navigating successfully these family relationships is that we would have the mind of Christ, that we would think like Christ. And as we begin to think like Christ, we approach this life the same way Christ approached the life that he walked when he was on this planet, that God will bring joy into our life. Would you rise with me? I wanna pray for you. May we be a people who have the mind of Christ. We would consider ourselves no reputation. We wouldn't care about the way we look. We wouldn't compromise our Christian values and what God is calling us to do. You know, our measure and our bar for success is Jesus. It's not the world standards. It's only Jesus. What are the Holy Spirit asking you to do? Sometimes we think to ourselves, okay, I... I'm going to consider no reputation, but then God's calling us to do something, but we're worried about what other people think. Now, I asked the staff this past week, I was like, okay, what is an area that you can dream in for individual ministry that only God can do? We got to dream big and then trust the Lord and trust that he's going to do something beyond what we could ever imagine or think or anything that we thought possible. Because if our dreams are only relegated to what makes sense in the natural, man, then somehow we'll receive the glory for it. But what we want to do is we want to dream big to where only God can do something. When God moves in such a way within our church and with our own individual lives that only he can receive the glory, amen, that we would serve one another, that we would die to ourselves. Let's pray right now.